Hello, welcome to PM Express. We will be assessing how the year has gone from various sectors and on issues. Tonight, we'll be assessing how this year has fared as far as governance is concerned, this country's governance. Yeah? There's a wide range of things that come under that umbrella that we'll be interrogating tonight. With me to do that is uh, George Chebafo. He is a former president of NALAG, uh, a man who understands this issue quite deeply. But I'm happy to host him also because of his intimate knowledge of local government and decentralization. There is a big conversation happening right now about the process leading into a possible referendum that will make it possible for us to vote for our district chief executive. So where are we with that? And his own thoughts on the process going forward. It's part of governance, by the way. We'll be interrogating that as well. Mr. Balfa, thank you for your time here on PM Express. Thank you very much, Ivan. So if you look back this year, what are some of the key themes for you in terms of the key issues of governance that you think this, this country has, has had to contend with? Yeah, generally speaking, um, I look at um, governance in a wider perspective and identify that um, there have been some major policy initiatives uh, when we put 2018 in, 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 into perspective. We can look at the setting up of the Office of the Special Prosecutor, mm -hmm. which is a major um, landmark in the governance arrangement of the country when, it, when we want to look at um, accountability um, in the governance discourse. Then we have also begun the process of um, amending Article 55.3 of the Constitution that would enable um, political parties to participate in the local governance process. Um, the, the bill has been sent to Parliament. Parliament has looked at it. It's gone to the Council of State. It will come back to Parliament and the process will continue. Eventually, we would end up um, with, with a referendum next year. Um, I also believe that uh, the ultimate is to ensure the direct election of MMDC is. That's also in, in process. Um, we have begun uh, another process of creating six new regions. And that started some time ago this year. It's, it's gone far. We're preparing for the referendum um, next week. We, I can also look at um, the property addressing system, which is also taking off and uh, eventually going to provide a platform for MMDAs to access data for revenue mobilization. At least for now, I can talk about these yeah. six or seven key yeah. critical um, initiatives. Let, let's start with the most controversial of these, the attempt to elect our DCEs. It's been promise made, promise uh, not kept for a while. The current government also made a promise and they began the processes towards it. Initially, they had said that they were going to um, do it this year. We know that's not possible. It's been postponed to next year. People say, here we go again. It's not going to happen. From where you sit, fundamentally, and you've been through the process, you've been local government champion for a while. Do we need this in, our, in the sum of our political history as a country? Well, um, like you already <coughs> observed, I, I strongly feel that we need that. You see, if you look at the historical antecedents of our current um, constitutional dispensation, mm. you realize that there was an attempt to decentralize the governance, um, the legal and the legislative you know, regime of decentralization in this country. But because of the antecedents, um, we didn't want to let go uh, the powers of decentralized institutions in, in its entirety because of um, maybe the consolidation of um, legislative and executive power in the hands of the PNDC, which began the process of uh, democratization leading to the 1992 constitution. So we have had to live with um, the imposition of a partisan superstructure on a, on a non-partisan substructure, mm. which indeed provided a very controversial basis for decentralization. You know, um, very contentious, very contradictory. You have uh, 
I mean, uh, a 70 percent elected institution, 30 percent appointed, and then the most powerful person also appointed by central government. And you premised it on a non-partisan, uh, 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 you know, admonition. Meanwhile, you have a partisan member of parliament, also a member of, of that institution at the local level. So you blend partisanship and non-partisanship. And I think um, things don't work that way. We have had a lot of controversies. We've had a lot of you know, contentious challenges arising out of this situation. So everybody in this country, indeed a sizable percentage of Ghanaians, have advocated for you know, the, the, the removal of that cross and then redirecting our energies to a partisan uh, substructure, which will be in tandem with the partisan superstructure, so that we will have a harmonious local governance arrangement and eventually, or for that matter, a harmonized um, governance structure for, for the country. Which why why, why do you think it's been so difficult for the politicians to, to act on this promise? Well, it, it, it is due to the, the, the African, I mean, the Ghanaian attitude towards you know, power and authority. Because um, you have a central, a central authority headed by the president, very powerful, and then I think that these presidents have not wished that they share the, the power that, you know, is with them, you know, uh, with, with local government authority. Because the chief executive at the local level is also an executive authority which, who also wields a lot of power. So it's like you give, using the left hand to give out and then the right hand to take it back. The president appointed the chief executives and then they would be in sync with the chief executive and, and sync to the tune of the chief executives. That is the issue of, you know, power. Of what real tangible benefit is, is it if we elect our, our, our DCs? I mean, what would it mean for people's lives in reality? What would they deliver that this current status quo is not delivering? Well, you see, if you look at the <clears throat> fundamentals of our present constitution, you realize that it's premised on accountability, participation, democracy, and good governance. So if you have a system, I mean, whereby you have the most powerful person leading the crusade of development, at the local level, appointed by the president, and for that matter, um, kind of responsible to the president and not responsible to the, to, the, to, the, to the people. And then again, also superintending over a supposed elected institution of a district assembly. Mm. Then we are in for trouble because the man is supposed to implement, the man or woman, woman is supposed to implement the policies of the, of the structure of assemblies to bring about development to the people. Meanwhile, he's not accountable to the people who are supposed to benefit from his actions and inactions. And I, I think that that's not the best when you want to tie it but in. But the president with, appoints him. The president appoints the chief yes, executive. And the, and the president is elected. Yes, the president is elected. So the president is the ultimate uh, representative of the people. And so if he's appointing, it, the presumption is we, the people, have given him the authority to appoint. And so if he appoints and the person he appoints, fails to deliver and doesn't account to the president, then we hold the president responsible. So we'll knock him off when four years come. So that, doesn't, that clearly addresses your, your concern, doesn't it? Well, I think that this is, this is a purely moral argument. If you look at the constitution holistically, you realize that Ghanaians voted for a centralized system of government and then a decentralized system of government at the same time. You look yeah, at true. Article 240, Ghanaians voted for a decentralized form of government at the local level based on devolution of power, authority, and power is, responsibilities. It's devolved. We, no. have, we have the district level elections. Next year we'll have another one. Yes, that's okay. So, yes. But you cannot elect people 70% and then allow the superstructure to impose 30% No, on the them. superstructure is not imposed. The superstructure is elected by the people in the biggest, biggest election of this country ever has, the presidential election. But that's not what Ghanaians voted for. Ghanaians <laughs> voted for an executive president who would deal with, with the issues powers of macro authority. To, to appoint the people at the district level, at the decentralized level. Yes, but what we, 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 we gave him the power to make the appointments. Yes, but the, 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 the decentralized arrangement as contained in Article 240 of our Constitution did not envisage 
a president superimposing his authority on, on local government units. I wonder why, why you say he's superimposing his authority. We've yes. given him the authority to make appointment. Is an appointment an, an imposition? Yes, but you have to tie that in with the kind of governance arrangement that Ghanaians voted for. They voted for a governance arrangement on the basis of a centralized national government and then a decentralized local government. But it's decentralized and they said there's, a, there's an element of the people's will in that decentralized arrangement, which is additional level elections. No, but we are, really, we are looking at the ultimate. The people expect that the, the foundation of the, the, the decentralized system that they voted for includes devolution of power, authority, resources and competences. That's what but they voted just for. The chief executive who the president appoints cannot work, cannot do a thing, cannot expend money given him without the consent and the buying of the people that we vote for at the decentralized level. It doesn't, things don't work that it, That's way. how it works. It doesn't. If the DC, if the D, if the, if we don't have the elected members of the assembly, the DC, he alone is, is, is absolutely bereft of any authority in terms of spending cash. Yes. But and you've been there, you know that. But, that, but the issue the doesn't necessarily end with the, with the spending of cash. The issue has to do with the mandate with which you, you spend the cash, the but mandate. The, but that's the point I'm making to you, that the mandate to spend mm -hmm. is only effective mm -hmm. if the elected executives or members of the assembly buy into it, they vote for it, and contribute to it. Without them, you can't spend. You cannot exercise that mandate. Yeah, first of all, you look at the assembly, it's not only constituted by elected representatives. You have 70% who are elected, 30% appointed. You are you're also... just making my point stronger. The no, 70 I am not. The 70% elected make it possible for the 30% appointed to work without the 70% constitutionally and legally. That's 30% will be totally useless yes, to but, use the word. All of them are, 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 are embedded in the structure. And you look at the overbearing role of MMDCEs. You look at their functions. They have a very overbearing, you know, influence in the, in the assembly. Can they spend then, without oh, the 70%? No, not, not, not necessarily spending without the 70%. They cannot spend without the entirety of the assembly. That's, that that one is line. very clear. That's where the development is. Yes, but, but, but the, other, the other issue has to do with the accountability to, to the people when it comes to their performance. They will have to, first of all, the mandate must come from the people. The people will have to determine which kind of person they want elected. Because, you see, it's not the, only the issue of, I mean, spending with the authority of an assembly. But it's, it's only a, when you spend a, that you have a, to account. No, no but, there, must he account but there's, a, there's a issue of initiative. <laughs> there's an issue of acceptability. There is an issue of, 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 you know, proactivity. These things ought to be determined by the people. The people will have to determine which category of personalities that they wish to lead them at the local level. But they do. They need the mandate to but do they, that. But they do. They don't. They do. The chief executive percent of that assembly is elected. So yes. People I, I, have I'm, a huge I'm looking, I'm looking at the chief executive who will have to provide the leadership. He has to give the direction to the assemblies to, to operate. For instance, he has to, to, to deliver his session address every year to provide direction to the assembly. If you don't have a chief executive who understands the people, who knows the expectations of the people, who are, who are in tune with the people's you know, requirements and things like that, these things cannot but happen. But isn't the reason why you mentioned that they must deliver a sectional address, that is accountability built right into the structure? Yes, but, but, but it's subjective. You deliver a Do they have a choice to do it or not? What I'm saying, yes, they, whether they have a choice or not is not the issue. The no, issue but they is don't have a choice. Then. Before you <laughs> deliver a personal address, you have to have the mandate of the people. The man will have well, to well, derive his authority. But they derive his authority from the ultimate sovereign. Which the is the president. Yes. And that's not what Ghanaians voted for. I have, I have said so several. That Article 240, which is an intense provision in the Constitution, clearly states that we shall have, Ghana shall have a system of decentralization that is premised on devolution of power, resources, and competence. You're saying we haven't devolved, we haven't devolved. I mean, you can look at it. Place or we the have issues partially in... devolved. Which, which one is it? 
Yes, we let, let me say we've partially devolved. Yeah, because we've look, devolved seventy percent of it is gone. No, no. But devolved. you are only looking at the, the membership, the blend of membership. That's not the only issue that has to do, to but, do but, with this. If we let the DC, it it's, it goes to membership. Look, as we sit here, if tomorrow the president decides that I want to sack sixty percent of DCs in Ghana, he yeah. will do so. True. Without recourse to anything. True. I know, but that and is... And we gave him the power to do that. that. No, no, we didn't give him the power. You see, you are placing the issues, I mean, the way you, you wish it to be. No, the, the way the Constitution says. No, but be. the Constitution says that we shall have a system of decentralization that is, that is based on devolution. So the, the authority of the chief executive must also come from the people. Because if you, are, if you want to talk about but, but that's why democracy... I that's, why I, that's my contention. What is your contention? That you say... If in this current, the, the, the current structure, the uh, appointment of the DC doesn't come from the people. You can't make that argument when the man who appoints is a voting for by the people. No, no. I mean, the issue it's is when that... We run a representational government. Yes, I agree. Exactly. But, so but the man is... who is making the appointment is making the appointment on your behalf and on my behalf. If you disagree with his appointment, you suck him at the end of the day. No, but we years. are looking at governance in its entirety. And the constitution has provided two two channels of governance, the national one and the local one. Mm. And the local one, there's emphasis on the fact that we need to have de a democratic sub-national sub I mean, structure. We should have a, a substructure that is accountable, a substructure that is participatory, a, a substructure you know, that, that, that derives its authority from the people, ultimately. So that is different from, I mean, taking a source of authority from the president. I, I think it, it is not democratic enough. Mm. It is not. Because look, let me give you an example. If you look at the, the, the operational regime of assemblies, the assemblies per Article 252 are supposed to derive some resources from, from the center mm -hmm. by way of the Disassemblies Common Fund. Sometimes you have had Disassemblies Common Fund being in arrears for four, year, four quarters, a whole year. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the assemblies are, 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 are corporate bodies with perpetual succession. They have the power to sue and be sued. The assemblies have the power to take government to court for breaching Article 252. But because of the overbearing influence of MMDCs, they who are supposed to lead the crusade in, 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 in taking government to court for, breach, for constitutional breaches, this has not, never happened. You have assemblies being denied of resources that are, that are supposed to come to them by virtue of a, an intent provision in the constitution. But because of the nature of the governance arrangement, the governance architecture, nothing happens. You get my point? So we have to look at the constitution holistically, and that is the more reason why we set up a constitutional, constitutional review commission, which also kind of recommended that Ghanaians in their, total, in their entirety wish to have elected MMDCs. Again, you look at the, the, the selection or the appointment of the 30% government appointees. You can go into history. Almost all the appointees, right from 1994, when the system began, have come from parties in government. Meanwhile, there's an intense provision in the Constitution, Article 55.3, which says that political parties shall not kind of meddle in, 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 in governance at the local level. They shall not sponsor candidates. Article 248 also emphasizes that. But de facto, we have it happening. So you have appointed persons by partisan presidents into the assemblies, which are supposed to be non-partisan institutions. MMDCs, you look at the process of appointment from 1994 to today. It's, it's partisan. You are parties which, 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 that's the recommendation to the president. And I can assure you that in all, in, 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 in all instances, almost all the MMDCs have come from parties in government. So they are clear partisan leaders at the local level. Mm. And it contradicts the, the constitutional expectations. So in assessing this year on this matter, what do you think about the process so far? Well, I, be to I believe that um, we've made a lot of strides. Like I said initially, um, the president has re-echoed this kind of um, promise 
severally, even yesterday with yeah. his media encounter. I mean, he said the only reason they had to postpone it to next year is that it makes sense to do so because once it saves you costs, because you're going to you can simply add the referendum as part of the district level election. Exactly. So, so you're killing two birds with one Good. stone. You agree with that? Yes, yes because we, we, we desire to amend Article 55, and that's an intense provision. Mm. So you need to do a referendum. And um, to save costs, like Riley said, you add it to the next to next year's disassembly elections. And then once the amendment is done, then the process can kickstart. And mm. he has stated clearly that we need to go full hog of partisanship at the local government level. And that's the best for us. Because you cannot, you know, kind of deny some other parties when they are in opposition from participating in governance at the local level. Because the president of the party in government has the opportunity to, to, to appoint his, his people to the assemblies. Mm. You get it? Yeah. And appointing his people to chief executive. What happens to the other political parties? Meanwhile, we need, you know, the ideas, you know, the support of all Ghanaians, irrespective of their political opinion, to participate in governance and to, and to also support the process. <clears throat> you also laid out at the, at the beginning what you thought to be the key governance issues. So you talked about the formation of the special prosecutor's office. And that really raises a whole range of issues that will expand on. But let's start specifically with that office. This year has been a challenging year for that office. In fact, really? the man know. at the helm of affairs himself had publicly stated that he's being starved of funds. He doesn't see his, his ability to do his work has been, has, been, uh, has it's been affected, right? So has it been a fruitful venture this year? He's had a whole year and done virtually nothing, right? What's your assessment of that? Well, um, first of all, the principle of setting up the office is really a plus for government. Because um, this is the first time we have we having a special prosecutor with that wide range of powers. Um, as contained in, in the establishment uh, instrument. So that, that's, 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 a, that's, a, you know, a plus for government, like I said. Um, let me also say that the intention is also good. Because at least it will give, it will send signals to people in, 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 in positions of responsibility that indeed an office has been set up and eventually we deal with issues of corrupt practices within the system. Mm. Of course, be, because this is the first time of setting up such an office, um, we would encounter teething problems like we have had this year. Um, the prosecutor was envisaging a legislative instrument which will indeed actualize the provisions in the establishment yeah. proclamation. Which and in itself has delayed. Yes, I, I think that, 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 that is not the best for us. Um, but fortunately, that has gone through. We are through with that. Um, I, I also su 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 suggest that um, maybe because we had set it up, just set it up, um, we didn't allocate enough resources for the office to kickstart. But hopefully, next year, it will go full hog because now there's a budget for it. Um, it has procured an office, even though it's, it claims not, that the office is not so spacious. I believe that next year the office will start. Um, it, will, it, will, it will be alive and kicking, and um, it would will, it will sort of enhance the, 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 the credentials in terms of accountability. Speaking about and, that, the, uh, that particular problem is replicated in other areas, so the institutions of accountability, charge, um, uh, uh, and the other state institutions mandated to the Yoko, etc. They always complain about being starved of funds, charge in particular. The special prosecutor is just the latest in the stream of things. And this year hasn't been any different, so it begs the question. And we've heard civil society groups within the space of anti corruption say this week. That is a lot of lip service still. A lot of the corruption cases haven't been dealt with quite substantively. There is a bigger conversation we need to have about if we believe corruption is one of the biggest problems in this governance space, 
why are we not giving it the needed resources so that we could we could win the war? Well, what what do you think is the problem? Is this just that we lack the resources, or there isn't the will by the politicians to devote enough for the fight? Well, my generic observation is that you see, <laughs> governance is a holistic process, and um, there are so many dimensions to governance. And uh, when it comes to uh, the issue of um, corruption and things of the sort, people are a bit skeptical in, 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 in kind of be being proactive. So I expect civil society and the media, like you have done, the media has done so well, the civil society groups have done so well, especially in coming to the rescue of the special prosecutor. The pressure that was put on government compelled government to kickstart the process of legislating on the, on the instrument. Yeah. And then also providing an office space. So I believe that, yes, government's intentions are clear. We want to deal with the issues of corruption. But perhaps, maybe um, because of inadequate resources, Government's attention in terms of allocating enough resources to the institution might not be attractive enough. But if we have civil society and media advocacy, you know, coming up strongly, I believe um, government will set up. Across the political divide, they would, they would all behave the same way mm. because resources are not um, adequate. But at least we've had a beginning and um, we all have to facilitate the process, continue with the advocacy to ensure that government really equips the institutions, like Riley said, charge and other um, anti-corruption uh, bodies, even including the police, the traditional police, the CID, you know, the office of uh, um, the other, the other uh, anti-corruption agencies. Yes, they, all of them have problems with resources yeah. and uh, indeed all other government institutions are pro challenges with resources. It's mm. not only the anti-corruption anti crusaders. The nation has, hasn't the adequate, the, I mean the requisite resources that could cater for all these activities at a go. Mm. But we have made a beginning and uh, we will have to kind of propel the stride that we have made and um, advocate for, you know, the, 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 the best things that ought to be done to be done and to ensure that we, we, we deal with the issue of, of corruption, because that is creating problems for Ghana and Africa as a whole. Corruption is a canker that is really disrupting our development process. Mm. We need to deal with it. And we have to have the courage, the political will, to, to deal with that. Talking about corruption, when we return from the break, this year, the Auditor General's report once again highlights how, how corrupt our local government institutions have been they, at the local level, the decentralized system, uh, assemblies. They're so leaking billions and billions of CDs. We'll be examining why this narrative doesn't seem to change. Every year, the Auditor General will highlight these. The next year, you can almost take the same script, just change the figures, and, and return a similar verdict. We'll be analyzing why that is and why this year hasn't been different and then look forward to next year and see whether we have enough initiatives to fix the problem at that level. Stay with us here on PM Express. We are analyzing the, the year um, that 2018. And with me is George A. Bafo, he's a former president of NALAG, he's also a, a local governance expert. Uh, Mr. Chebafo also, we just talked about corruption, which was one of the things you highlighted in, in, in looking back on the year. And we know that this year, once again, the Auditor General's report once again highlights a big problem. In fact, if you look at all the corruption that we talk about, the chunk of it happens at the local, local assemblies. Billions of CDs. When you read the figures, you, would, you start up. You've been there. You, you still do consult, consultation on, on that, on the, on the issues. Irregularities, 
these monies, these bears that hasn't been used, contracts that have been given that and and yielding anything. It, it, it's it's a whole mess down there. What is what in God's name is a problem? Well, um, it's a very unfortunate phenomenon, and um, I attribute it to institutional failure. Because you see, the, the decentralization is a process, and it's, I mean the assemblies are systems which have been set up with various characters operating within it. But of course, the back stops with the MMDCs. Um, first of all, the assemblies have the authority to approve of, to formulate and approve of their income and expenditure um, programs. They will have to fix their fees, rates, and licenses, aggregate the entire revenue that they expect, tie it in with external inflows, and then prepare the budgets and approve them. In the course of the implementation of the budget, the assembly is supposed to keep track of it. That is why, if you look at the local governance finance arrangement, mm. they have what we call the, 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 the monthly trial balances. That indicates the specific revenue inflows and then specific revenue outflows. Mm. So at every point, every given point in time, the assemblies are mandated by law to, to determine whether budget implementation is within the remit of the approved systems. Mm -hmm. But for all you know, like I said initially, um, sometimes you have the finance committees, the finance and administration subcommittees of the assemblies, which are responsible for overseeing the, the income and expenditure trends of the assemblies. Sometimes it depends on the strength of the committee to be able to perform this important function. Because every month they are supposed to find out how much money has come in, how much expenditure is going out, what are the trends, are there over expenditures, are there expenditures outside approved budgets, these things they ought to do. If they don't have the capacity, they will not be able to deliver. Mm. So that's a major institutional failure. Mm. And then every assembly has an internal audit unit. If you have an internal auditor who is compromised, then the issue has to wait until external auditors come in. Because if internal auditors were performing their functions effectively and efficiently, we wouldn't encounter this kind of challenges. Because every voucher that is raised at the level of the assembly will have to pass through internal audit mm. for scrutiny before approval is given. But because of obvious compromises, you don't get you know, the full benefit of such an important institution. And then you have the malfeasance happening. Um, you look at procurement entities within the assemblies. The head of entity is a, the chief executive. Mm -hmm. The Public Procurement Act, Act 63, clearly states the processes through which we will have to do procurement at the level of the assembly. Mm -hmm. Indeed, as human beings, you could have excesses in these institutions, but there should be some mechanism of monitoring any possible excesses. And that has to do with the regional coordinating councils. Sometimes they also go to sleep. You have the ministry, which also has oversight responsibility over some of these issues. Yeah. Yes. So, um, like I said, it's an institutional failure. And as a nation, because we have agreed to a system, to adopt a system of decentralization to pro, I mean, upon which the totality, the totality or the entirety of development at the local level is premised. We have to, to do a lot more, building the capacities of assembly members. So in this instance, if for instance you have um, the assembly system going partisan, political parties would have to nominate candidates of their, of their preferred choice to contest at the 
at the, at the uh, letter area level. And I believe that because of the competitive nature of the system, when it goes partisan, the quality of membership would improve. Because every political party would want the best to go to the assembly to ensure accountability and effective participation, effective oversight. So, I mean, quality will improve. And that is going to be near to the benefit of the performance of the institution. You, 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 you diagnose the problem as a failure of, of institutional yeah. failure. Yeah. But you've worked in a local government. Isn't it also because the people that <laughs> the system elects, 70% of them, that you, you, you think is in it now, are inherently corrupt people? Because really, they, a lot of the problems, it's as you mentioned that, and that isn't that what the problem is? That we are electing all these people who are just there to serve their self-interest and they have I, no... I, 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 I don't think so. I, I, I <laughs> sincerely, I doubt whether the issue of corrupt assemb elected assembly members can even come into play. Mm. Because as why, assembly why can't members... Why I mean, isn't the reason why... Isn't the reason why we... we isn't the reason why that is, a, that is a case? Well, if you want to say they are inept, fine. But corrupt, because you see, they have no direct contact with, with, with financial uh, uh, mm. management or administration. But they supervise that is best, but they are part of the process. Yes, they, they supervise, but their supervision has to deal with capacity, mainly. That's, that's my observation. Mm. Because I, I cannot envisage a situation where an assembly member would compromise you know, for, for financial benefits. I mean, I, I have been in the assembly. You before. say it doesn't happen? Well, I cannot rule it out completely. but. Even if it happens, very, very, it will be in very minute cases. No, very but minute they, instance, they, they, less they, than one percent. The, the Auditor General's report would disagree with you quite substantively. I think what billions going down the drain every every year. You're saying that people aren't doing this. They're not a huge, sizable chunk of people doing it deliberately for self gain. Well, but if you look at the report, the, the Auditor General has not been indicting assembly members. The, the indictment is on, I mean, some institutions within the assembly setup. Yeah, but people who, who manage the, the resources, that's, that's where the indictment goes. It's not on the assembly members. People who? But the people the who assemblies manage resources. Have, yes, the finance officers, the internal auditors, the MMDCs, the coordinating directors. These are officers who spend assembly, money. Are, these are some of them elected members of the assembly. These officers? Some of them. No. You are a staff, if you are a staff of the assembly, you cannot be a member of the same assembly. Mm. The law, you know, debars you from, from that. So we, you, you think the solution is what? Well, the solution is to, is to build the capacity of assembly members. You see, you elect somebody into such an important position. La, this assembly, for instance, they went for orientation for one day. And I believe all of them were, were, were sent to the regional coordinating councils, very large numbers. And they were, they, were, they, were, they were orientated one day. What can they learn? Meanwhile, they have a lot of functions to perform. They perform legislative functions, they perform executive functions, they perform administrative functions. They perform supervisory functions. You can't, they cannot use one day for, I mean, their functions are more or less just like the, the Parliament of Ghana. Even some, to an extent beyond Parliament of Ghana, because Parliament deals with only legislative authority. Mm -hmm. But at the, at the local level, they have executive authority as well. You get my point? Mm -hmm. So. If people are elected and their, their capacities are not built, they do not understand their rules, they mm -hmm. don't understand their functions, they will not be able to perform, definitely. But, but, but what you say is quite striking. I've been practicing this decentralized system at least since the promulgation of the 992 constitution. 1992 to 2018, yes. we're still talking about yes. building capacity. That challenge has been pervasive since 1994. Why? Well. You see, if you want to train If people, that is a solution, why don't you invest in it? You see, you have to place all the issues in context. You see, decentralization all over the world, you have never, we have never had a central government that is willing to cede resources, power, competencies, authority to local government units, units at, at, at its own will. Mm. It has never happened. You need some level of of, of advocacy, some level of struggle in order to ensure that. So if, for instance, you have um, 
a party in government in any African country that appoints a chief executive and you have a very strong, healthy assembly as an institution that will place a check on the appointed authority. You get it? It affects the ability of the center to influence the... We, the, the, we are talking about capacity building. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. The center about. also has to provide resources for that capacity building to happen. Yes, because when, when the assemblies are elected, they will have to be sworn in by the, by, the, by the minister before they activate yeah. their, their, their functions. And they will have to be trained because they are, they are, they are a national institution. They are national institutions, so to speak. Mm. And for that matter, the Ministry of Local Government will have to take steps to train them, mm. to equip them, in order to fit into their roles. So if the ministry does not you know, engage <coughs> in a very kind of in-depth training capacity building for them, it becomes a mediocrity. So, so let's look ahead to 2019, uh, the year ahead of us. What must change for, for these key governance issues that we still acknowledge has been a struggle in 2018? At least for us to make some inroads, to make some gains. What, what, what must change? Let's, let's start with, I mean, we know 20, 2019 is a key year because of centrally the potential that we will have the constitution amended to make it possible for DCs to be elected. That, that's, that's a key thing. The process is spelt out so that there's no challenge. But if you look at the resourcing, the accountability institutions, for example, and giving them the free hand to work, in 20, 2019, what do you want to see differently? Well, I, I, I think that um, civil society, like I said earlier, civil society and the media will have to intensify the advocacy on government to provide resources. Because, mm -hmm. look, we can, we can say all the things that, that we want to say, but governments will not willingly be able to make resources adequate resources available to every institution of government in this country. Mm. That one is not going to happen, at least in the, in, the, in the next few years to come. But once accountability and um, fighting corruption is on our radar, Mm -hmm. We need to look at that as a priority. And that cannot come out, out of magic. We need to, to, to sustain the pressure on central government to provide the resources. Like I, I gave you as an instance, when civil society and the media put pressure on central government, the legislative instrument to actualize the, 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 the enabling regime, uh, I mean legal regime of the special prosecutor has come to, to, into, 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 into focus. Now the, the instrument is passed. The office has been provided. So incessant pressure from civil society and media to provide, for, I mean, for central government to provide resources will have to be governized. That is very crucial. That the one is very important. Yes. And, and if you look at the, the the centralized system and the corruption that we see there. You said build capacity, build capacity. Of, the, of the people there. But will that in itself solve the problem? What else do we need to do to that? Well, what about prosecuting people? What about, what about that? Because what about laying down a marker of a deterrent to those at that, at that level who, so they, they, everybody can claim, well, you know, it's all my fault because I am not properly equipped to to spot where there's a, there's a, there's a fault or there's embezzled, whatever it is that we always point at, it's a very good excuse. But if your decision or inaction leads to loss, financial loss, shouldn't we be cracking the whip, jailing a few DCEs across the country? Isn't that part of the problem? Isn't that part of something we should be doing going forward? A tougher approach to, to dealing with the rot at the level of the decentralized system. Yeah, in principle, I agree with you. But basically, we need to strengthen the checks, the, the inherent checks and balances in the system. Mm. That's the most important approach. Because you see, if you look at the, the accountability arrangement, the Auditor General's report goes to Parliament. 
and then Parliament will have to, the Parliamentary Committee responsible will do public hearing and public sittings and engage the assemblies and all other institutions. The, the Parliament hasn't gotten the power to prosecute. I believe um, we have tried to um, engage governments in setting up a tribunal that would, that would be able to prosecute on the basis of the Auditor General's report. Mm. That could also be a factor. If we're able to set up a tribunal or a court, specialized court, that would deal with infractions um, as, as, as contained in the Auditor General's report, mm. I believe that the punitive steps or the punitive actions or the sanctions regime could also act as deterrent. But the other side of it is that um, we have to strengthen the inherent internal checks and balances. Now we are going to kind of um, amend the constitution to allow political parties to participate in governance at the local level. You know, political parties constitute a very important ph phenomena in ensuring accountability in the system. For instance, if you have a district which is controlled by, let, let, let me give an example, say NDC, elements within the other parties who are in the assembly would want to ensure that because they are not in the same party with you, at least you do the right things. If you create any more feasance, they will expose you. But as it is, it is the principle of winner takes all that is, that is prevailing. You have 70, 30% and the chief executive together on the side of the government in power, or the party in government. And then the 70%, obviously, even though the elections are non-partisan, they are partisan in disguise. So you have some of them also adding up. So almost every point in time, you have government dominance, central government dominance at the, at the level of the decentralized system. So if there's something to do with prosecution of offenders or, or people who have been identified with infractions, um, you can imagine the attitude that, 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 that will put up. You get it? So we need some institutional reforms, like we've started. We amend the constitution, part, political parties will be there. We will elect the MMDC if Auditor General identifies an MMDC to have embezzled, embezzled funds. The general public will get to know because other political parties will, will inform them. And the next elections, he knows that he has to account to the people of his stewardship. Mm. And for that matter, it, people will exercise caution. But as it is, you, you, you engage in an act of officials and you have a central government cover. Yeah. Yes. So hopefully, 2019 will be better than 2018 as far as governance is concerned. My guest has been George Chibaf. I'm grateful that you joined us. My name is Evan Spencer. Enjoy the rest of your evening.